So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like, first of all, to thank Jonathan, Manas, and Aditi for setting up this meeting, um, especially for the lengthy breaks where you know we had very interesting discussions. And uh, it's an honor to be here um, after such uh, speakers. Um, so actually, Joel asked uh, whether you know any application of uh, current quantization. Uh, I would like to ask if you know any application where parametric oscillations are not involved. <laughs> so parametric oscillations are, you know, very, very generic phenomenon. And I would like to discuss our own works on the topics. I'm sure, you know, I hope this will relate to things you have done as well. Yep. Ready. So I'm from Barilan University, which is uh, close to Tel Aviv. It's actually also close to Jerusalem, just because the country is so small. And you're all welcome to come and visit. Uh, I would like to first acknowledge the students um, that worked on the different topics, uh, the, and also some collaborators from Barilan and elsewhere, as well as previous students who actually did uh, most of the talk work that I will present today. And we've been funded by uh, the Israel Science Foundation by some private companies. Okay, so I would like to convey the message I would like to convey today is that parametric drives are cool, and I would like to do that in three uh, in three parts. So the first part will be about okay. The first part will be about classical systems. Uh, well, I will discuss one, two, and many parametric oscillators. The second one is also classical, but it's directly many body. And the third one is quantum. Is Ashish uh, here? You are here, okay. Uh, okay, then I would be, I will be careful about the third part. Maybe we won't have time to speak about it. Uh, <laughs> okay, good. So the first part is uh, about uh, just, uh, let's start from the beginning from a single parametric oscillator. So this would be the simplest uh, equation of motion that you can think about. And uh, okay, in PowerPoint, it looks like this. Um, I was at a conference on parametric oscillations and everyone would have this Wikipedia picture on the, on the page. <laughs> Uh, so the, the, it's basically, this, uh, so if you, what you can do, you can linearize the, the equation of motion and you will get the Matthew equations for which you can study the stability. And so it turns out that there is a stable regime and an unstable regime. Now in the unstable regime, that's the one which is interesting to me, you actually need to take into account the nonlinearities because the linear expansion breaks down. And what you will find is that there are essentially two solutions. Uh, and the two solutions are, uh, have a period that is half the period, so the, the time period is double of the period of the drive. And that's why you have two, just because there is a symmetry that is broken. And it's called the period doubling. It's also called discrete time crystal. And please don't ask questions. Is it time crystal? Is not time crystal? Uh, this is not the topic here now. Um, what is important for me is that when you have two solutions, it is natural to think of it as a bit. And uh, then uh, my collaborators at, at Barilan, uh, experimentalists, they said, okay, cool, let's, let's do that. Let's take two coupled parametric oscillators, we'll make a two-bit system and we'll sell it as a quantum computer. Uh, so that's what they did. This is actually not a quantum uh, oscillator, just a classical oscillator. You know, the oscillator is just a, a waveguide, a very long waveguide, so it has some base frequency. And they couple them. And uh, what they would expect to observe is that there are some oscillations and there could be, say, four answers, right? There could be two answers for the one oscillator, two answers for the other oscillator. So like something like this and this, okay? So it's shifted by, by half a period. So one and two. Uh, that's what they expected to observe, but instead what they observed were beating. And so then they came and they said, uh, you are a theorist, explain this to me, had no idea. Uh, but I had a very good postdoc, Marcello Calvanese Strinati, and he also didn't know how to solve it, but he had more time than me, and he studied the topic. It turns out that uh, one can, that there is a very well-defined way how to solve this problem, which is to go to the slow varying envelope approximation. So essentially you say, let's assume that it is a parametric oscillator, but with an envelope that varies slowly. So you just make, you know, e to the i omega pump t, uh, times some function, and then you solve, you write down differential equations, which turn out to, to be, and you can linearize them or actually even solve the full nonlinear uh, non uh, stuff uh, to find uh, the stable points. And uh, what you will find is a phase diagram, and the phase diagram will have three different phases. So there is the blue phase in which the only attractor is zero, so that's the stable phase, so whatever you do. This is a driven dissipative system, so you just end up with no oscillations at all. Uh, then there is another regime in which you see that there are four attractors. So these, there are indeed four solutions, 
This was the expected behavior. But in addition to that, you can have something that is very well known to people who know it, which is limit cycles. Uh, they're very common in nonlinear driven dissipative systems. And these limit cycles are essentially the envelopes of the parametric oscillations. And so that's what explains uh, the beating behavior. And you can even see that the beating behavior can have some very funny shape, which are uh, were observed both in the theory and the experiment. So the idea is that we have a very good understanding of what's going on. And when you have that, you can try to learn something out of it. And what I would like to learn with you now is about what are these R over G and H over G. So clearly these are two parameters of the model, but what are they actually? Um, so this R over G is the ratio between a real coupling and an imaginary coupling. It turns out that there are two ways that you can couple the oscillators, either in phase or out of phase. And depending on the ratio and, you know, in the, in the rotating wave approximation, they become uh, like a real and an imaginary coupling. In other words, there is a coupling that conserves the energy so that it's picking energy from one oscillator to the other. That's the one that you would naturally write down, but there can be also an, a, um, a coupling that is actually a common dissipation. So something that tries to bring them in phase. And, uh, and that's why we understand that when the real coupling, which is the energy transfer is large. So on the right hand side of this graph, that's where you see oscillations because the, the energy actually oscillate between one os oscillator and the other. Uh, while if the, on the left hand side of this plot, uh, so when the imaginary part is large, then what you observe is that they sort of go together and they merge toward some common solution, which would be some in phase behavior or out of phase behavior, okay. Um, so what we learn from this story is that um, there is an energy conserving coupling that brings to limit cycles and imaginary coupling, which is the dissipative one, and it brings to attractors. Um, and that's uh, sort of thinking can guide you towards what would happen if you combine many oscillators together. So that's a, a term that was uh, invented by, by Yamamoto. He said, when you couple many oscillators, you get uh, uh, what he called the coherent Ising machines. So these are just systems of coupled harmonic oscillator, coupled, sorry, par par parametrically driven oscillators. And what is the idea? So the idea is that each oscillator behaves like a spin. So these are Pauli matrices, you know, spins half, uh, plus one or minus one. And there is a coupling. And the idea is that you would like to write the coupling in the dissipative part. So you can use the dissipative coupling in order to write an equation that where the dissipation will depend on the configuration of the spin. And then maybe you could say, uh, let's build a system in which the configuration that I'm looking for, so for the solution of the Ising model, is the one that has the least uh, uh, dissipation. So this will be due to mode competition, the winner one. And then this, the system is solving an Ising model. So unlike the usual Ising model that you have in mind, where you write an Hamiltonian and you find the ground state, here the Hamilton, it's not an Hamiltonian, it's a dissipation term. It's a, you can think of it as buff engineering. So you, you, you engineer your dissipation so that the end, you know, the steady state will be close to your solution of the Ising model. Um, but there is a word that I use, which is a linearized, uh, you know, mode competition. The mode competition comes from the idea of linear approximation. The problem is that finding that mode is actually very simple, right? Finding that mode just simply means that you need to diagonalize a matrix. And actually diagonalize a matrix is simple. It's not an anti hard problem. You can do it in polynomial time. So something here doesn't work because on the one hand, I told you I'm solving the Eisen model, which as you all know, is an anti hard problem, right? You need, you have two to the n possibilities. It's exponentially hard. On the other, you're telling me, no, it's actually very simple. So what's wrong? And it turns out that what's wrong is that you can do that mode competition analysis, but what you will find is that the winning mode is not, sometimes it happens to be the solution of the Eisen model, but often it is not. So here what we wrote, what is the probability? We, we did an ensemble of, of, of many Ising models. And then we, we wrote the probability that the mode competition winner is actually the Ising solution. And it turns out that that goes down exponentially. So you are solving, uh, if you want, you are solving the Ising model with exponentially small probability. So then, okay, it's, <laughs> this NP hard story still works. And what Marcello found is that there is a way to uh, improve that. So we don't know if this will really it will improve a little bit, which is to add nonlinearities. It turns out that actually the nonlinearities, by sort of 
preferring, you know, making your variables more discrete. After all, what is the difference between anti-hard problems and, you know, vector, uh, vector linear algebra is that in linear algebra, these are continuous variables. So if these are continuous variables, like in a linear analysis, then you're really solving a matrix. If these are discrete, it becomes the Ising model. So what makes the Ising model hard and interesting is the fact that it's discrete. And then that's what the nonlinearities help you doing. Um, okay. So yeah, so that's our hope. Great. So this was part number one. Part number two. Oh, great. I have an infinite time. Uh, when did I start? Go ahead. I know that 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Okay. Um, so now, for first for part number two. Uh, so I understand that Takashi and one way, one way were here uh, the first week. Was there anyone here? I mean, when we last, what, is anyone that is here now was here last week? Uh, okay, Mari. Okay, quite a few people. So uh, uh, hopefully, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I saw the, the abstract online, but I don't know exactly what they talk about. So hopefully, I didn't talk about this review paper that we wrote together, because then it, you will find my talk very boring. Uh, but or maybe actually, you know, the paper, the review paper has two parts: a classical part and the quantum part. They wrote the quantum part; I wrote the classical one. So I'm sure that even if they spoke, they spoke about the quantum one. Uh, so you will still find the problem interesting. So let me discuss a, a model. Uh, which uh, is inspired by ultra cold atoms. You know, you, you can use, this is just an excuse. Uh, so what we do, we think about is, um, is taking some atoms, placing them in some uh, optical lattice and oscillating the optical lattice. If you don't like this story, but you like rotors, you can just really think of it as coupled rotors that you periodically drive them. Uh, so depending on which community you like more, uh, but that's, that's the idea. So, um, and this is indeed what you can do if you have many atoms in, in each site, then you can use a number and phase, uh, you know, number and phase approximation and write down the Hamiltonian as really some coupled rotors. Um, so how can you analyze? This is a very nonlinear system. So as before, the first input would be, let's do a linear analysis. And when you do the linear analysis, uh, what you obtain are just phonons with some spectrum. So this is what I'm showing you here. So this is the, the wave vector and this is the eigenfrequency. And then you can ask, I'm periodically driving the system, is there a parametric resonance or not? Well, it depends on the driving frequency. Is the driving frequency is low, like here? So this is low drive, low frequency drive, slow drive. Uh, there is a parametric resonance. But if the driving is large, then there is no resonance. So uh, according to this very simple picture, you would expect that at low driving frequency, there is energy absorption there is, because there is a resonance. And at high driving frequency, there is no energy absorption. So something like, now I'm plotting it this way. This plot will come many, many times. So, so, so remember the, 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 the axis. So the first the x-axis is the frequency. So this is slow frequency. This is large frequency. So slow drive, fast drive. And this is heat rate. Uh, and what you would naively expect is that there should be something here finite and something here zero. But then, of course, you know that I'm, I'm cheating because I'm using a linearized approximation. And you, what you really need to do is to take into account the nonlinear system. And actually, people did it uh, by studying this model. So this is some numerical work, which was also accompanied by an experiment by the Emanuel Bloch group. Uh, they did this. They take, took this model and analyzed the heat ring rate as a function of diving frequency. What they found is that there is something on the left. So that's cute. There are parametric resonances. Actually, you can see these resonances, essentially. And then there is something else. So there is energy absorption also where the linear, but it's natural, right? The linear tells you no absorption. Clearly, there is some nonlinear terms. What is interesting is that these nonlinear terms go down exponentially. Okay, that's, and that's the key, the key aspect. This is what I'm going to tell you now. How comes uh, the exponential rate, the, sorry, the heating rate is exponential in the driving frequency? Sorry, Manuel, I have a question yes. about this plot. Yes. How large is this frequency with respect to the band separation that we have in the model? So this is exactly the bandwidth. This and eight is the to eight the bandwidth, right? The, the single particle bandwidth is exactly eight. Uh, but, but then you have no linearities, right? So, so they, they can contribute something. Um, okay, so um, also this is the, the key, uh, you know, equation you need to remember that the, the energy heating is proportional to the exponent of the driving frequency over some something which is the bandwidth, uh, right? It could be I don't know two lambda, four lambda, something. Um, so how you wh why does this occur? So there are two reasons why this can occur. One because it must occur, and one because it could occur. So the reason why it must occur was discussed by these uh, in these two papers using these two approaches that are reviewed in the paper, uh, in, the, in the review paper, uh, but they work for quantum spin chains. So what is the, the idea? 
The idea is, is like this. So you have a quantum spin chain. So locally, there is an energy density that you can at most absorb, right? A spin can at most go from up to down. So at most, there is some energy that it can absorb, but you are trying to drive the system at very large driving frequency. So because H bar omega is the energy, it means that you are like trying to eat a huge chunk of energy having very small uh, mouse. And that doesn't work. So the way you solve it, if you bring, bring many friends, in other words, you need, you know, you need to make many reconfiguration of your, uh, of your from the initial to the final state. And, but the point is that that would be a very large order in, in some interactions. So it's basically very large order in perturbation theory. And uh, the, the order of the perturbation theory is related to this omega over lambda. Right, but that immediately means that it's exponential in omega over lambda. So, in other words, when you have a system that has a finite energy density, so a, a bounded local Hamiltonian, uh, and you're driving it at large driving frequencies, in general, the energy absorption is exponentially suppressed. Not only it should be exponentially suppressed, it must be exponentially suppressed. The problem is what you do if you have a system where the local energy is not bounded. And for example, in the example I gave you before, you can place as many bosons as you wish on site. And so the local energy is not bounded. Or if you have rotors, the rotor can oscillate as much as you wish. So locally, you don't have a bounded local energy spectrum. So you cannot apply these theorems. Uh, we claim that you can still use a statistical argument to explain what you observe. And also Marin Bukov and, and Sergey maybe also have done related works. And if, you, if what I'm saying resonates, uh, parametrically resonates with something you've done, you know, come and talk to me. Um, so th that's the idea. So we, we sort of coined this term, statistical preterminization, pre which is in contrast to the rigorous one. Uh, what is the idea? Okay, the idea is the following. The idea is that why is this exponential suppression coming out? Because of the Boltzmann distribution. So the assumption is the following. I have a system which is at very low temperatures. To begin with, I try to drive it, and when I try to drive it, the system tries to probe some resonances. But the probability of finding that resonance is very small. Why? Because it's related to the Boltzmann distribution. In a moment, I'll give you an example of that, that, that works. So let's think of, for instance, the Bose-Hubbard model. In the Bose-Hubbard model, you can place as much local energy as you wish. So if you have a site with many, many, many atoms, then the energy of the last atom will grow, will is proportional to the number of atoms you already have. So if you want, you can absorb much, much energy by finding a site where you have many particles. If there is such a site, great, I can drop that site from a neighboring site, I will absorb your photon, your, your drive. The problem is you, you naturally see that, oh, wait, what is the probability of finding so many particles on one site? I mean, in principle, you can. If the system is thermodynamically large, you can. But the, but the Boltzmann distribution, the equilibrium, the, the Gear Gibson sample will tell you that uh, don't, don't, don't uh, invest there. This is a very low probability. High risk, high gain. Um, okay, so what does that mean? So that means that if I now look at the energy of the system as a function of time, what I will observe is that there are two regimes. One in which the system uh, is basically pretermalized, so it absorbs very, very little energy. The point is that this very little energy that you're absorbing in the long run, so if you wait really, really long times, eventually it will heat you up. And when you heat you up, you can find rotors that oscillate very fast, that are in resonance with your drive, and then you should be heating up. So there are two regimes, and that's peculiar to the statistical pre-thermalization. There is a regime of pre-thermalization, which is really a thermal regime, just not with, the, with a low temperature. And then after that, if you wait long enough, uh, and how long do I need to wait? Well, because the energy heating rate is exponentially suppressed, you need to wait an exponentially long time. Uh, so that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the idea. I don't have time anymore, right? No, no, you have. Oh, actually, I tried that, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, so the, the last work is about just a single resonator. Uh, and the relation to squeezing. So this is an idea that Ashish put forward. He said, uh, in my words, uh, that you could take a resonator and you can, could periodically drive. And as you all know, if you periodically drive a quantum resonator, so before the resonance occurs, okay, not in the, in the, in the stable regime, what you will see is some squeezing. Then eventually the squeezing will well, split into solutions and that's an unstable regime. But in the stable regime, you have like a squeezing like that. So uh, that squeezing, Maybe you can use it because it's larger on one direction. Maybe you can use it to couple to a two-level system. So use that quadrature. There are two quadratures. One is more squeezed than the other. Then maybe you use the one that is more squeezed 
Uh, can, can you lower the microphone a little bit? Maybe. Um, the, the one that is quizzed, uh, you can use it to couple better to, to some two-level system. And uh, the, the Hamiltonian is the following. So you see these squeezing terms. OK, this lambda is the, the amount of squeezing. So it is this a squared, a dagger squared. That's the one which is squeezing. And then there is a coupling. And the idea is that you, dia you can diagonalize the resonator by moving to uh, you know, di diagonal gamma and gamma dagger operator. And what you will see is that now the coupling between, OK, so there is the coupling between the one quadrature. The good quadrature is gamma, gamma dagger. The other one is gamma minus gamma. So the good quadrature, gamma plus gamma dagger, is now coupled more strongly to a two-level two system. And so this more strongly means that nice. Uh, so what you see here, this is a paper from, 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 uh, from Ashish, where they, this is the driving frequency, and this is the spectrum. And they say, without squeezing, so no drive, there is no splitting. So no splitting means that essentially your cavity is not, doesn't feel the two-level system. It's like there is no two-level system. When you increase squeezing, you will see these splittings. Um, and so in principle, it's very nice. So nice that my colleague Michael Stem said, okay, I'm, doing, I'm going to do the experiment. Uh, I said, cool, let's do that. So we, we, we tried to, uh, so that we had to really read the paper very carefully. And what we found was that there actually is, is a fine print in the paper that you need to squeeze not only the cavity, but also the word outside the cavity. If you don't squeeze the word outside the cavity, uh, that's what which generally is sort of hard. Uh, but we didn't know, you know so we just didn't read the paper carefully, otherwise we would have known it. But we didn't read the paper carefully, and then we saw that if you don't squeeze the, the, the word outside the cavity, then this doesn't help. And why this doesn't help? That's what is important. It doesn't help because uh, there is some noise. So when you squeeze, you are also basically putting photons in the cavity, right? A squeezed cavity is an occupied cavity, and an occupied cavity will have larger noise. So really our work was to sort of quantitatively, uh, this, this was again known in, in the paper by Ashish Clark, we, we just wrote a paper in which we quantified that uh, amount of noise and tried to say in which regimes still the noise maybe is not too large and doesn't kill you. That was basically the, the idea of the paper. Um, and, and so that's, that's the, key, uh, the key point. The key point is that, which, which also connects us back to the beginning of my talk. Uh, so the idea is that when you have squeezing or some parametric drive, there are two effects. There is a good effect, which is some uh, large good in this term. Here, it's good. So it's a larger unitary coupling between the spin and the cavity. So that's something that will give you a splitting, you know, something that you would like to enhance. But there is also some enhanced dephases and enhanced uh, dissipation. And uh, what is nice is that there is a recent experiment by the uh, Condos and Legas group in which they really saw that. So I don't want to uh, go into the details of this experiment. I just want to tell you that this is lambda. So in the x axis going to the right or going to the left is, is, the, is the squeezing. And what you see is that when you increase the squeezing, you will have more strong and enhanced coupling. So that's the exponential curve that, that, that Ashish was talking about. But at the same time, you also have an exponential uh, increase of the dissipation rate. So the noise in the cavity will eventually deface your two-level system. And so it's, it, that's really, it is actually very challenging to find places in which the two effects do not. So you, this is the wanted effect, this is the unwanted effect. So the hope is that now that you know what is the, say, the analytic expression for both of them, you can work in a regime in which the one will be larger than the other without the need to uh, squeeze the vacuum outside the cavity, which is sort of challenging. Okay, um, so what we did, did we learn uh, till now? So uh, we studied a, system, a classical system of one, two, and many parametric oscillators, and we have seen that there are some specific type of couplings, which are known as energy preserving coupling, which will lead to limit cycles. Uh, and also we have learned that the nonlinearities may help. Uh, so, you know, no, linear analysis is nice, but sometimes nonlinearities uh, are important. We have spoken about statistical flow pre-terminalization, and again, I invite you to look at, at the review paper. Uh, and this is the key signature of statistical flow pre-terminalization, is that as a function of time, you see that the heating rate uh, is sort of exponentially suppressed, and then changes. And what you see here is that I'm changing the drive by only you know, a factor of five, but the time uh, delay is enhanced by 10 orders of magnitude. So you, I mean, exponential is, is a lot. <laughs> so sometimes, you know, changing the frequency a little bit can give rise. Uh, I can even tell you that at the beginning, when we first did the studies, we thought that, oh, it will never heat up. Uh, then we, we studied that more in detail, and we saw that, yes, it will heat up, but the time is going to be exponential. 
So an exponential dependence of the heating rate on the driving frequency, that's the feature, that's the, uh, the feature of uh, identifying feature of flow cap determinization. If it comes because of statistical reasons, it's called statistical flow cap determinization. And then I told you something about squeezing and uh, how squeezing is both good, good, good and bad. Um, then I have two bonus slides. I have, time. I have time for two bonus slides. So the first bonus slide is that parametric values are cool, but quantum computers are cooler. Uh, and I apologize for the sexist uh, uh, slide. This was just from the, from the internet. Um, so, uh, and I would like to tell you about quantum simulations using quantum computers. Uh, I think that we've been very active uh, in the last uh, couple of years. And we studied also topology, uh, edge states, um, um, you know, no local games, long range interaction, some simulation of those Einstein condensate. I mean, we propose many, many uh, sort of simple circuits that will mimic interesting many body physical effects. And um, what is nice about this paper, first of all, that I wrote them, but in addition, it's not, <laughs> in, in each of these papers, we have some implementation. So we were able to get something out of the quantum computer. It is always something that you could have, you know, obtained on your, on your you know, calculator sometimes, or even on a board, I mean, very simple things, sometimes a little bit more complicated like this, uh, but the quantum computer was responding in a way that you would expect it to respond. That was uh, very encouraging for us. Uh, so if you, you know, think about organizing another conference, ITCTS, think about quantum simulations of quantum computers, uh, you know, you are, I can already suggest a speaker. Uh, so last slide, promise, last slide. Last slide, this is a very important slide. It's about smart archive, personal selection of daily preprints using AI. So you, are, you totally, totally need it. Uh, write up this, uh, this uh, website because uh, the application is so obscure that you won't even find it on Google, uh, but it's extremely useful. It's for free. Uh, and uh, yeah, it takes, you know, all the preprints, the daily preprints, and the, according to the, your previous works, it will suggest, uh, you know, some relevant works. It can even suggest all the, all the works just ordered. Uh, and it will also suggest you a random paper that you really must need so that you won't, you know, focus only on things that you already think they're interesting. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, just one small question. So there seems to be a change in slope when it starts to get the seating thing. Uh, the second, yeah. So do we Here? understand why there is this change, uh, this slope change occurs? Um, so no. Uh, okay, so let me tell you the answer. Uh, I actually, I know the answer. Yeah, I know the answer. That's great. Yeah, I know it. So the answer is, that actually these curves are all the same curve. However, they are like started at a different point. Now, uh, so it, because it depends what is your initial energy. So you wait, the system heats up, and now you look at these curves, you say, but they are not the same curve. The reason they look different is that we are, because they are in a log scale. If you plotted this curve on, on a linear scale, you would, they would exactly overlap one on the other. They are just the same evolution. Actually, what is nice is that they are just the solution of this equation. So the E over the T equals to A E to the minus E over mu. Okay, is it large enough? Uh, so you, you, can, this is the, you, know, you can plot the solutions of this curve and you will see that they exactly represent what we see here. So the only thing you have is just one quasi conserved quantity whose time evolution is exponentially suppressed. And because of the log scale, they appear at different slopes. Let me just follow up. But I, I fully agree on, on the long time scales, but then if they're exponential, why are they not parallel? They are parallel at the very end, but at the beginning, there seems to be a regime where they're, they're not parallel at all. You, you mean here, the very short times? No, 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 I no, mean that like in, the, in the red curve between no, 10 because, to the two. Uh, yeah, exactly. Between the two, they're not yeah, yeah. parallel. So Here? this is not exponential. No, no, you see. No, 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 no. no. So you see, uh, how much time did it pass from here to here? 100, right? This is 100, this is 200. Now, how much time passes from here to here? No, no, this, uh, this I think is very clear what you said. Yeah. But then my question is the following. If, it, if it's an exponential slope, yes. if it's an exponential dependence, then it should just be straight lines, right? No, 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 no. These are the solutions of this equation. It's mm -hmm. not an exponential. 
I'm not, you need to solve this equation. This is E of ah, T. Okay. So you, know, you need to solve this E of T. And it's not the sort of, now at very long times. Exactly, it's just a long very time. Very long times, the then, then, uh, yeah, yeah. then, no, I then, think I see then, your point. Yeah. Then you just get a linear, something is completely wrong here. Um, no, no, it's clear what you want no, to say. No, actually, yeah, yeah. yes, but this is wrong. So let me fix it so that it will be fixed for, for our, so it's mu over E of T, okay? So E of T is the temperature, okay? Mm -hmm. And this, this now, now it makes more sense. This is the solution to this equation. So at very long times, this goes to zero, just as get a linear slope. And that's what you see there. That this is linear. I mean, here it's just a linear curve. In, in before, before that, you have some nonlinear, uh, differential equation you need to solve. Maybe, yes, maybe in fact this was one for eight. Yeah. <laughs> that's, maybe that's the answer. Right, right. Please. Ah, so uh, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, so you, you mentioned your statistical flow cape pre-terminalization not being as rigorous as the other. Uh, as being non-rigorous as the other. At what was, why? What's the... Why? What? It's because it's statistical. So sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. No, but you can formulate. I mean, I, my question is, can you formulate it again in a, is a rigorous proven thing? So, okay. So when we first submitted the paper, uh, I think uh, actually Takashi was one of the three, and he said, this is a no rigorous paper, you know, <laughs> drop it in the you know, trash bin, trash it. So then, you know, finally I said, if you can't beat them, join them. So that's why we wrote this review. I think it's like, you know, a philosophical question of what you would call rigorous and I mean, what is, me, uh, it's, it's not rigorous. Sounds... I mean, it's uh, the Boltzmann yeah. distribution. It's not a rigorous theorem. Boltzmann distribution is um, a statistical argument. No, but this to me sounds well okay it sounds completely airtight there's nothing for me it's like more a person you know let me tell you this joke so you know there is this famous question of what is quantum and what is classical right because photons are quantum but actually they wait they are, are classical and for the other so the, the true answer is is classical is what uh, you know quantum is what you do classical is what the others do so rigorous is probably the same rigorous is what you do no rigorous is what well whatever uh, but it's a good idea. I mean, now seriously, I think, you know, if one could formalize that better, uh, I would uh, I would be ready to <laughs> invest in that person. Okay, okay. Thanks. Thank you. Can you please explain again what the uh, statistic, what is statistical here? Because I, I think I lost uh, track. Yes. So, 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 yes. So let me, so, so, so that was very fast. So let me give, okay. Um, so what was statistical is this one. Um, okay, here. So I would like, I, I'm looking for resonance. No, 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 this, this, in the runs. So you prepare your system, you have some initial conditions, then you drive it. Yes. You drive it in this way, one plus some amplitude time, times cosine. Yeah, well, in practice, this is numerics, is that in a, in a kick, kicked way so that you can solve it numerically. It's kicked. Yes, okay. it's kicked, yes. Mm -hmm. yes. And, and the frequency is two pi over the period between the kicks. Yes, okay. exactly, exactly, okay. yes, yes. And then uh, what means statistical here? This, uh, you don't see this for every run? You have to average? This, this is an different? average, this is an average over. over many runs and many rotors. What if you take one, okay, what's the system size? Uh, 200. And if you take only one run, what will you see? Well, even if you have take one run, uh, there are 200 rotors that you're averaging over and this is translation invariant. So I think it would be a little bit more noisy, but not, crazily noisy, so, um, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Y yes, this is, this is in the thermo, yes, exactly. The thermodynamic limit is the same as repeating many, many times the same experiment because I'm taking the average uh, energy, energy density. So, so this equation, it's some sort of uh, erroneous mechanism or like this, this energy equation that we write here on black. Where does this come from? It's, um, it's, it's basically based on the assumption that your pre-thermal state is thermal. And then the temperature is set by the energy. But the energy itself changes because there is energy absorption. So I'm not saying you, you need to find a system for which the energy is exponential. Is, well, you, you see, it's, so it's sort of quite generic. I mean, there is a Boltzmann distribution and you assume that the heating rate is proportional to the Boltzmann distribution. And so what is the rate that mu is? I mean, it's what, what is the energy scale that in the mu? The mu is the driving frequency. 
so, so here is where the driving frequency will come in. And also maybe other energy scales in the problem, like the, the bandwidth of the system. So thanks for a nice talk. I can't help but make a comment on the on the last part. So so definitely this this issue of just simply squeezing what's happening inside the cavity, you're still having this heating physics is, is something we were worrying about in that original paper. There's another generic strategy for avoiding that, and that is sort of time dependent protocols. So if you turn on the, the squeezing drive, you can basically get an ultra strong coupling, do something with that before the heating kicks in. Um, and in superconducting circuits, you often already have a pretty strong coupling. This is a way of getting into the ultra strong coupling regime where the counter rotating terms and the light matter interaction matter. But um, yeah, thanks. Yeah, so there are other ways of also using this idea to yeah. hopefully avoid the heat. It's, uh, yeah, it, 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 it's an interesting proposal. It, it's not the first time that Ashish attends this talk. And <laughs> he also made this comment, which is really, I mean, yes, I, I, I could agree. And, and it's great that the experiment actually did see. They, they did that in, the, in real time? Yeah, oh, I see. So I haven't even read the paper, that, the, the experimental paper carefully. I'll do that. Thanks, Ashish. Okay, one last question. So then maybe let me ask it. Did you, at the end, uh, recover the scaling that Emmanuel saw in, exp in his experiments? Uh, in terms of the, I mean, of course you get the functional form correct from your theory. Yeah. Uh, were you able also to look at the quantitative okay. agreement? So um, the problem is that they are working in a regime of one particle per site. So then you cannot, uh, you cannot map it to rotors because the phase number phase uh, argument is you have many atoms per site. One atom per site, you can use the, this, this picture, which is basically a perturbative picture in the tunneling. So, uh, so and, and in the opposite regime where the interaction is strong, you can use a, 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 a strong cup, right, a perturbation theory in U. So we have done the semi-classical approximation on both sides, and in both sides, we have seen an exponential suppression. Unfortunately, or luckily for them, I mean, the interesting part in the experiment is that they precisely are in, the, in between. And in between, there is an exponential suppression on both sides, but it's very, very, it's much longer than what we observe in, in reality. So analyzing, you know, using a, a classical argument, a quantum a system that is inherently quantum, but maybe not, not a good problem, which also means that there is more, more work to, be, to, to do to sort of extend these statistical arguments uh, to quantum systems as well. Thank you, Manuele. Well, again.